Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. My name is Janine Donnelly. I am the manager of webinars for IBM System Magazine, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Today's webinar, The Human Side of Automation, What Makes It Work For You, is sponsored by Throughput Manager. Our featured speakers today are John Baker and Denise Calm. John is a ZOS performance specialist with over 20 years experience as a user and consultant. John has designed, implemented, and maintained many critical projects such as WLM goal mode and GDPS data mirroring and assisted many of the world's largest data centers with their ZOS performance challenges. He has held subject area chair positions with CMG for several years. He's a popular speaker at CMG, SHARE, and IBM conferences. Denise is the Chief Innovator at Palm Creative, Inc., and a board-certified career coach with DPK Coaching. Her 30-plus years in IT inform her work in both marketing and coaching. She has been a capacity planning and performance analyst, as well as a working in pre-sales and marketing as a software vendor. She's a published author in both the IT world and outside, and a frequently requested speaker. Her books, Career Savvy, Keeping and Transforming Your Job, and Tech Grief, Survive and Thrive Through Career Loss, are available on all book and ebook sites. With our introductions complete, John, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Jean, and thank you, everyone, for attending. I just want to say on a personal and professional note how pleased I am to be presenting with my friend Denise, known each other for a long time and never had the opportunity to do this before. So I hope you'll find this informative and interesting. Quick agenda. Um, we're going to talk about automation from many facets, why it doesn't look good, uh, what's changed in our world, in the world of IT, and significantly, what do the changes mean to the need for automation? Um, automation's a good idea, but how do these changes affect that need? Specifically, what can automation do for you? And then we'll talk a little bit about what would a great automation solution look like, and I'm going to touch on a couple of aspects of our throughput manager automation. Uh, there will be lots of time at the end for questions as well. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to pass the ball over to Denise. Thank you, John. And I'm also looking forward to presenting with you. It's our first time. And for some reason, it is not advancing. <laughs> oh, Denise, go ahead and look at the screen. There. Sorry. So for a lot of people, this slide really represents what people think automation means. If it can make your job easier, it can probably make it irrelevant. Find the right software, companies will downsize even more. And that can be scary. And for some people, automation seems to cause problems. We're going to talk about different types of people who are resistant to automation. And see if you don't find some of your colleagues as we talk. The first group are the do-it-yourselfers. No commercial software is good enough. These might, in the latter days, have been assembler experts or experts in other esoteric languages. They claim their work is self-documenting and blindingly obvious. It's a career lock for them. If they do it themselves, how do you replace them? But it's a maintenance nightmare for everybody else. I was guilty of that. <laughs> well, and a lot of people in the Unix Linux area are command line junkies. They know how to get into even the best software through command lines and they believe they can find things better. Forget menus. They have the inside track of speaking with the us. No one else can do it so well. And back in the day when I wrote Assembler, we used to do things that weren't very legal. And I can kind of relate to this particular type of person. Fearful pre-retirees. As people get closer to retirement, the last thing they want to do is have software replace them. 
automation could spell the end of their careers before they're quite ready. And with the economic downturn, a lot of 401ks became 201ks. The fear isn't totally ungrounded. It can happen, but in general, software isn't the reason. Now, John's way too young to relate to that one. There are vendor haters. I, As a vendor, when I was doing that job, I still remember people who said, all the software is vaporware, and salespeople are fine. You ever heard this? And think of this. It's more frugal not to buy these packages. The vendor hater wants to show management how brave he is and how cost conscious he is by not spending the money on software. Then there's the old timer. This guy's never going to retire. But like the pre-retiree, software isn't as good as what he does. He likes old technology and may have an old 360 mainframe in his house. Very suspicious of the young even more suspicious of software. Any of you people have that person in your shop? Well, I think I was definitely that guy, too. <laughs> and then there's the newbie. They're afraid of automation for the simple fact that they think the automation's going to be able to do their job. When you're first starting out in IT, you're not the big expert. So couldn't software replace you? And yet, some of the software we've heard about, which claims to replace people, never really did that. Workload manager was going to get rid of performance people. Capacity upgrade on demand was going to get rid of capacity planners. BWLC, well, that was going to manage all your costs for you. So you didn't need people watching that. I absolutely well, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work as well, did it, John? It didn't replace people. What it did was empower people to do things in a different way than they could have done on their own, to, and then maybe to do something more sophisticated. Yep. I said, uh, bring in WLM goal mode and put yourself out of a job, and all that does <laughs> is keep us busier. Absolutely, and that, that's kind of the funny part is that automation – as we'll talk about later, is going to take away the stuff you don't want to do and allow you to do stuff that's far more interesting and challenging. But before we go further, where do you stand on automation? This is our first poll. So are you the person who has a small budget and you write all your own code? Do you believe you write better stuff than the vendors do? You might have some automation or operations, but as a senior technician, you don't use it. Maybe you have some automation software. You see the value for some kinds of automation, but you're careful, you're cautious. Or you love it, lets me do the fun stuff instead. So we'll take a few seconds and please, please post your answer and we'll see the results in a minute. I like to think I've probably graduated to that. I, I Admittedly, I was probably number two at one point in my career, uh, you know, I, I know the data and I know my applications and I know the systems and, and, you know, I know how to write the SAS and interpret it and so on. But we cannot keep up with the machines. It doesn't matter of smart share. No, or the complexity, which you'll be talking yes. about shortly. There's just too much to do. Well, and look at those results. We've got a, a decent number that actually love automation. Very nice. That's fantastic. So we may be yeah. to the already converted. Yeah. There's a handful, though, that are down there in the middle. you got to have some diehards. I respect that. So I'm going to pass the presenter's ball to John, and he's going to talk a little bit about more of the issues around automation. Thanks, Denise. So what's changed in IT? Well, I mean, that's that's a loaded question, obviously. What's what's changed in the last year, last decade? You know, even in my, I would say, relatively short career in, in the mainframe world, coming up in around 25 years, 
I've seen the birth of the internet. That would be substantial. And, and recently, uh, the death of VTAM. My goodness. Um, we, we, we never thought that would actually go away. I, I remember the days when you knew every single device that your systems were connected to. But let's just focus on a couple key questions here so we don't get lost. I think these are really important to ask yourself. What are you doing today that you don't need to be doing? And what could you be doing if it weren't so hard to do it, really? Um, are you still running the original RMF post-processor reports manually every day where each page is a single interval for a single service class and a single system and manually stepping through all of that over the course of you know, virtually your entire day just to look at the previous day's events and then going through it again and again and again. Like, what could you be doing? If, what else productive could you be doing if you, if you weren't spending time on that? It, it gets so complex. I mean, this challenge to me is becoming all too common. We've got fewer of us forced to manage more things. We might know how to manage all these individual tasks, but really it's just not practical to think we can manage them all. This is just crying out for automation, the environment that we're, we're working in. I'm thinking about the end of VTAM, you know, before the widespread adoption of uh, IP networks, you know, back then, we knew about every single connection on our data center's network. Uh, and those, they're just gone. Those days are gone. Today, customers and users can get to your applications anytime, anywhere, from almost any platform. You can't define or manage all of these devices, which means you can't predict their behavior. And this leads to the next point. This ease of access and this proliferation of applications means exponential growth. I guess we don't say applications anymore. We say apps, right? That's the cool term. I got to learn to keep up with the cool kids. Um, I mean, we even created a new term, big data. Was big data even a term five years ago? I don't think it was. So we can't ignore this growth, but I don't think it's something we can manage manually either. You just really have to ask yourself, how are we going to learn and manage all of this new technology? The Internet of Things I was doing some reading on that recently. Every device, every, you know, your refrigerator, your, your car already has a lot of smarts in it. You know, your stove is, is going to tell you when it needs maintenance. Your fridge is going to tell you when you need to buy, buy milk. This is all creating these massive amounts of data. Um, and how are we going to learn all of these things and manage all these things when we have fewer and fewer of us to do it? I'd imagine this is how some people must feel at the end of a work week. You've got fewer and fewer people, and you've got more and more things to keep track of. You know, gone are the days where we had a department for every subset of our technology in the data center. We now are asked to take on more and more things. And we can't manually do that if we're going to do a good job. And let's face it, it's not going to be any fun either. Um, we should enjoy our work. I'm going to pass the ball back to Denise now. This is fun, this back and forth business. Thank you, John. Well, besides it just being difficult, to do this work, to deal with those increasing challenges, and then some challenges we haven't even seen coming yet. Don't we all worry about our career? Don't we all want to be successful in our career? Too many of us are interrupt-driven. We're constantly doing the next emergency, dealing with the next problem. But we have a chance to choose. Choose what you do with your time. Don't lead a life by default. And I think that's really critical because is it really fun to be interrupt-driven, to be constantly running from one 
crisis to another. I suspect there are people who do enjoy that. But I think most of us prefer to have a day that we're a little bit more in control of. And the only way to do that is to look at automation. Brian Tracy said, there's never enough time to do everything, but there's always enough time to do the most important thing. Are you doing the most important thing in your career now, or are you doing what is just there, what just comes in? Are you controlling your career? Are you guiding your career? Or are you just doing what you have to do? That's not that much fun. So let's, let's see what we can do differently. I really believe that the keys to success is not the quantity of what you do, a laundry list of problems solved. It's the quality and importance to the business. Is what you're doing now the thing that adds the most value to the bottom line? Is it bringing customer success? Is it increasing profitability? Is it reducing costs or saving time? When you work on that, you will be recognized and rewarded. And I think you'll have a lot more fun because your opportunities for career growth are really, really increased. If you're doing well in your job, if everything's going right for you, that's great. But I believe with all the changes coming down the road, that won't last long without automation. Virtualization and cloud are changing everything. What you do now, the processes and procedures you use now, won't scale. Automation may be the only thing that saves you. But the good news is that automation has come a long way and is now a facilitator for you, not a replacement. You get a chance to grow and learn and give all the boring work to a machine. And it just might get you promoted. So what should automation be if it's going to meet your needs, your career needs, as well as the needs of your company? Let's face it, we all think about ourselves first. It should be easy to install. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to make it simple. You want it to be easy to learn, especially if you're my age. You don't really want to learn something complex and hard at this point. You want it to be easy and intuitive. It should be customizable because every company runs things differently. Every app is different. You have custom needs. It should be adaptable because everything changes by the second. As John referred to, when we controlled who got access to our system, we really knew how the pattern of demand would be. We don't anymore. Your automation has to be always on, so you don't have to be taking calls in the middle of the night and integrated with the operating system. And there should be minimal maintenance. And you want a proven solution. So let's ask, now that you've heard a little bit about what could benefit you, What's in it for you to automate? What of these items matters the most to you that makes you rethink where you stood on automation? Management rewards those who cut costs. Management rewards those who find efficiency. I'm bored with the manual labor. would love to do more interesting and valuable things. That was my motivation. I've been stuck in this job. Automation might help me move up. Layoffs are coming. I want a way to show my value. And the work I do now won't do it for me. And finally, I'm retiring soon. If I don't automate, the company will have issues when I retire. So please. I've seen that happen. Oh, I've seen people time. actually say, you know, I'm going to go. So, you know, we need to automate. You know, well, I might have been the, you know, the smart old man on mountain. But guess what? You know, I'm not going to be around forever. So we need to do something about this. Uh, interesting yeah, results. Yeah, it's quite scary. Uh, a company could find themselves in a really bad situation when someone retires that's done it all themselves. They may not even know where the software is that the person was using. 
Okay, so we have some results that have come in. Efficiency. That's obviously important. Harder and harder to, to find those things, particularly if you're doing it manually. Board with the labor, I think that was that was yours, right? Oh, Being yeah. bored with the manual labor. Yeah. And and a few people are concerned about layoffs, which I think is, is a real concern. What, nowadays, yeah. somebody has to show their value in ways that not just their immediate manager, but higher level managers can relate to. So, to go further, I'm going to pass this back to John, and he's going to talk about how you can automate. Thanks, Denise. Batch, yes. Oh, I love my 3270 screen. Now, maybe everybody doesn't, but I do. But think about this for a minute. Is batch something you still want to work on? Uh, I'm not I'm not trying to say batch isn't important. It's a big part of my career. It is really important. And really, it is it's critical workload. It's every bit as complex and demanding as as the shall we say more popular online workloads. But what if you didn't have to manage it? Is this something that you would be willing to give up if you could automate this part of your workload? But first I I want to talk about where batch fits into the picture. I would say that even if you don't care about batch, you should. In most data centers, batch represents, say, 30% or more of the workloads. In a shared environment like ZOS, that means that that batch is not only important on its own, based on its, the amount of workload it represents, but because it's a shared environment, batch jobs can negatively affect other workloads. So in a nutshell, even if you don't care about your batch, if you care about your onlines, you're running in a shared environment, you want to make sure that batch is not impacting those other workloads. So I want to highlight two specific areas where batch, I would say, is being challenged and show how intelligent automation can deal with those challenges. Now, this is pretty current. I was at CMG just a couple of weeks ago, and Dr. Pat Artis gave a speech on the potential end of Moore's Law. If you're not familiar with Pat, Google him. Uh, he, is, he is simply uh, one of the smartest guys in the business and a really nice guy as well. It was good to see him back at CMG after a lengthy time away. Anyway, Pat discussed many aspects of the problem, this potential end of Moore's Law, but he focused on a simple yet powerful point. If we set aside costs, we, that is us in the IT industry, have always lived in an environment where we could buy a faster processor. That is to say that option was always available. When in doubt, you could throw hardware at the problem. And Pat asked that simple question, the title here of the slide. What if you can no longer buy a faster CPU? What if it literally wasn't on the shelf to buy? Now, that's the world that we might be facing if the predictions about Moore's Law are true. The bullets on the slide here, these are actually from uh, Kathy Wolf presentation that I attended a few years ago. And she makes a simple yet powerful point as well. If we can no longer count on faster CPUs, we'll have to grow capacity by adding more CPUs. Now, the technical folks in the audience will know this. What happens to the speed of an when more CPUs are added to the pool? It slows down. Now, if you're a short transaction or a multi-threaded application, that might not affect you. You might not care. But batch tends to be single-threaded. That means the speed of the batch job is dependent upon the speed of the individual CPU, not the number of CPUs. And that's where Kathy's conclusion comes from. It's highlighted in orange here. The impact of growing machines wider by adding CPUs will slow down batch. So what can we do about that? 
let me just show you some of that intelligent automation I was talking about. Now, these charts are from a recent customer running a proof of concept of our throughput manager automation. One of the most effective ways that throughput manager improves batch throughput is by managing utilization. Before starting the next job, TM checks the utilization of the machine and the target LPAR. It also checks the performance index. Now that's a measure of how fast the workload is running, how well is it meeting its goal or not meeting its goal. And it checks the CPU delays of that target workload. And basically, if the conditions aren't good, the job will wait. There's no sense in starting it. It's a, it's a lot like not getting onto a, a gridlocked highway where it's just full and, and no one's moving. It's not going to do you any good. And in fact, not only is it not going to do you good, it's going to slow down everybody else. That's just physics. So by automating these algorithms on every LPAR, the environment is more balanced. As you can see in the top two charts, that's before and after picture over several days. And the throughput is improved. And that's uh, in the bottom chart. What we have here is a series of 5,000 jobs that were run night after night. And in the first two days, highlighted in the bottom left, this is how the, the average execution time of those jobs. And all the remaining evenings were their average execution times under throughput manager. It's a simple enough concept. You, you simply don't run things when you're overloaded. But it's not something that you can easily manually control because your demand changes every second, your utilization changes every second, uh, and you have to consider the importance of the workloads too. This is just not something that can be manually done. This is and who something would want that to? needs to be automated. And yeah. who would want to, John? It, I mean, you're talking about night. Who wants to sit up and, and be tweaking batch all night? Oh, that's that's brilliant. You're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, this is not something you get to do during the middle of the day. So you're going to be sitting at your console um, measuring what's happening and then trying to make a decision all night. You're absolutely right. doesn't make sense. So that's the technical challenge. Then there's the economic challenge. Now, IBM has been talking about CMP or country multiplex pricing for a while, but CMP only recently became generally available. Now, just to be clear, country multiplex pricing does not lower your existing invoice. It simply reduces the cost of future growth. Now, large shops in particular are going to want to move to this new pricing model, but there's a big catch here, and I can't emphasize enough how important this is. Before moving to CMP, IBM will ask for three months of SCRT data to determine your baseline pricing. Now, this baseline exercise is a one-time event. So before submitting your three months worth of data, you want to do everything you can to lower your baseline. Now, this isn't just me getting on my soapbox. Um, Many other smart people that I've already talked about, Kathy Walsh, Cheryl Watson, are absolutely hammering this point home. Because as the points say here, this really is a huge pricing announcement. You definitely want to move to it. But your baseline is, is a one-time event. You, you want to have that baseline absolutely as low as it can be, which means you want to look for Automation means to lower that baseline, because this is yet another thing that can't be done manually. Now, this is another customer example. This shop didn't want to use soft caps, and th those are viable options. Soft caps are, and through from manager will work very well with those. But in this instance, the customer just set an MSU threshold within their throughput manager policy. And in a similar way, which TM automates concurrency based on utilization and throughput, the automated capacity management feature of TM 
can reduce the MSU consumption of selected batch based on your targets. This will bring down the rolling four hour average, which in turn lowers your monthly software bill. But using automation like this not only frees you up for more interesting work, but it improves the responsiveness of your system and reduces costs, which are a couple of the big things on the poll. And again, takes the workload off of you. You don't have to do it. Absolutely. As you say, you know, if you're rolling four hour average, you know, maybe it's peaking in the middle of the day if you're lucky, but quite often it peaks at night. Uh, quite often we're not aware of all of the workloads that contribute to these rolling four hour average peaks. Uh, and it's a one time monthly peak. I mean, you literally have to identify a single peak hour in an entire month. It's not something you can just sit and manually monitor and adjust for. At this point, um, before we close, we do want to open the floor up to questions. Uh, I know we've covered a lot of areas, so uh, just going to pass it over to Janine. And if you can let us know what we've got for questions. Great. Yes, we have some questions, and I want to invite our attendees to continue to submit your questions in the Q&A panel at the lower right-hand side of your screen, and please address them to all panelists. Okay, first one. I've seen people lose their jobs when automation comes in. In fact, that's why our IT managers are interested in investing in automation. So why shouldn't I be concerned? You want to start, Denise, or shall I? Well, I'll start. That's, it does occasionally happen, but if you are career motivated, if you are building your abilities and learning and growing and are responsive to company needs, you're much less likely. Also, I have seen cases where the person who opposes automation is the most likely to get laid off. If you embrace it and then immediately talk about what it will free you up to do, what additional value you can offer, you're very much less likely to get laid off as a follow-on of that. They'll see the value that you can then bring as a result of the automation and want to keep you. John, do you have anything to say on that? Sure. No, I agree. But uh, also, in the data centers that i have visited over the past several years, there is a, a shrinking of the workforce and an expansion of the responsibilities. So where you used to have, say, a team that was responsible for performance, another team for capacity, another team for databases, another team for storage, another team for networks, you have fewer and fewer, and they're combining these responsibilities. So there's no shortage of things that need to be done. Uh, and to do these tasks well, you know, we really want to choose, well, what do I want to work on? Back to those earlier questions. And what can be automated? Um, it just makes sense to, to recommend some automation for some of these things. There's, there's no shortage uh, of work to do in, in the mainframe data centers that I've visited. Okay. I, I would totally agree. Sorry, Denise. Um, here's another one. Too often, a vendor will come to me with something that isn't nearly as good as the code I write myself. Uh, why should I even listen? I'm not afraid to be perfectly blunt. If somebody gives you automation that's simply no good, I wouldn't buy it. I would However, buy good automation. <laughs> However, I would look further to see if there isn't a better solution because really, do you want a fair part of your job to be maintaining the software you've written. Because as IBM changes things, as workloads change, you may have to be in maintenance mode, for which you're not going to get a lot of credit from your management team. So I obviously don't buy bad automation, but ask yourself, if one company's got a solution, somebody else probably does as well, and that solution could take you out of the job of being in maintenance. And I'm not sure most of us really want to be maintenance programmers. Yeah, that's really not fun. Okay, next one. My technical abilities are my ace in the hole, 
why that's why I keep my job. Why should I be focused on anything else? Quite honestly, if you are not training people to do your job, you will never move. You will never move up. You want to be giving away what you know and growing on your own. So if if you are stuck in knowing how to do one thing, and that's that's your ace, that's nobody else can do that, at some point that may go away, that function. You could have been the best VTAM person. I didn't realize that, job that VTAM was going away. Oh, my God. It was just recent. <laughs> <laughs> how shocking. Uh, but yeah. you could have been the VTAM expert for your company, and now it's gone. What? What do you do now? So part of our world, if you're going to be in IT, is to continue to grow and learn and take on new responsibility. And I've learned over my career, if you are not training other people, you will never get anything else interesting to do. And I think as we grow, we want to grow our not just our abilities, but our position in the company, our relevance to the company. We want to be seen as a leader in IT. You can't do that if you're just sitting on one skill set that may be coming obsolete anytime soon. Great point. Um, John, this, I think this one's for you. Can you elaborate on how Throughput Manager helps me if Moore's Law is coming to an end? <laughs> That's, that's a very long discussion for sure uh, to get into the technical aspects of throughput manager. But uh, it's basically at a high level uh, to address that particular aspect, what throughput manager does is, as I discussed in the, the earlier slides, manage the utilization. If I can't get a faster CPU, what I really need to do is optimize the efficiency of my system, like how efficiently am I using the existing CPUs, and my existing infrastructure at the speed that I have. Um, and that is really all about managing utilization, running the right amount of work at the right time based on the workload demand, based on the priorities, uh, and based on the ability of the machine to manage that work. Because the mainframe does offer us such a wealth of information about how well things are running and how busy it is, if you automate the, the collection of that in information and you automate the actions as a result of that information, which is what Throughput Manager does in this area, you can automatically react uh, in the most efficient way possible at machine speed uh, by running just the right amount of work. It, it, it's essentially the same concept as just letting enough cars onto a multi-lane highway so everybody is doing 75 miles an hour. As soon as you have too many cars and the average speed starts to come down, you pull back the number of cars on the highway. If you have more room, you add more, and you have to automatically do that. Okay. What if batch isn't a concern for you? Um, is there a reason to still consider throughput manager? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's just the shared environment concept. If you're only running a single application, you're probably not running a mainframe. Uh, if you're running a mainframe, I can almost guarantee you're running batch. Um, and this is shared virtual storage within our mainframe, uh, shared CPUs within the mainframe. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure is shared, which means every workload that runs there, batch included, can affect other workloads. So if you're not managing that batch well, even if you don't care about it, it can negatively impact your other workloads, which you do care about. How about this one? We're a JES3 shop. Can Throughput Manager help me? Oh, great question. Uh, no, now, Throughput Manager, to be clear, only works with JES2. But I'll tell you, we do have a lot of customers that are finding uh, they either have to or want to move away from JES3. It's, it's not uh, very widespread. Perhaps they bought a company that was running JES3, and they want to move off of that. Now, if you think about a project of that scope, it's going to be huge. And IBM is certainly going to uh, help you at the system level 
in terms of converting the actual system code from JES 2 to JES 3. Uh, but the, a lot of the work, what you're going to be left with is you've got your tens of thousands of batch jobs that you run today, and that JCL is coded to be uh, compatible with JES 3, not with JES 2. Throughput Manager today can already accept those uh, JES 3 coded batch jobs as they are and run them under a Throughput Manager automated JES 2 environment. So that's uh, certainly an area where we could help you get over there. Additionally, a lot of the functionality uh, in JES 3 that those JES 3 users like, uh, some of it, uh, recently IBM is starting to provide within JES 2, but a lot of it is already provided within Throughput Manager as well. So for those of you that want to convert without losing that functionality, uh, Throughput Manager is a big win. Okay. If a shop does not have batch during daytime, does throughput help to lower the rolling four hour average? Well, to be clear, if you have absolutely no batch whatsoever, um, then throughput manager probably couldn't help you. But I would question if that is the case. Um, even in my previous career working in a bank, certainly the, the peak um, utilization and rolling four hour average periods, which by the way cannot, are not necessarily the same times, would be during the day uh, when online was, was at its busiest. But there's almost always some batch running, uh, whether it's a little bit of development work, whether it's uh, maybe some important production, some users, you know, different flavors. If there's anything running at all, uh, and, the, and this question was specific to rolling four-hour average, which means it's cost. And let's be clear on that. Everything that is running, everything, during your rolling four-hour average peak is contributing to that software bill, even if it's running down in discretionary. So all of it should be considered, including that small amount of batch. And I'd also ask the question, if you don't have batch running during the daytime, I bet you have online running against batch then that is, you know, that's something to look at. Very few people have the ability to just run batch at one time and online at another. And that goes back to what John talked about with all the devices and people contacting you from anywhere on any device. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of it may not have been scheduled in the old days, but these days, you know, various processes that weren't, uh, you know, thought of or planned of may kick off batch shops at any time of the day. Absolutely. Okay, these are some great questions. Please feel free to continue to submit your questions. And Denise, I'm going to turn it back over to you for some additional thoughts. Thank you. having a little difficulty with it. In conclusion, I want to tell you that it isn't automation you should fear. It's bad automation. There are tools out there that really aren't very useful or very helpful. So you want to look at the tools to eliminate the work you don't want to do, work that keeps you from doing more important work, and work that no one else can do unless they focus on a 7 by 24. As I said, you don't want to be getting up in the middle of the night and tweaking batch. By looking for great automation, and I think John's really highlighted very well what kinds of things you want to look for. And it, it may be your best career decision, your best career move ever. And take a look at Throughput Manager. It's really an exciting tool to get rid of batch hassles that you may have never had the time to deal with, but may be impacting your online. Or if you have had time, it's probably not your first choice in what you want to do. So look at what else you could be doing. Let automation free you up to the career success that you want. This is a little information about the two of us primarily let's focus on MVS Solutions and Throughput Manager. You can contact any either of us at our emails here and join the discussion at throughputmanager.com 
a blog where you can raise your issues and questions and comment on what we're talking about on a regular basis. Early next week, we'll be sending out a link to the recording, and there will also be a link to the slides on the MVS Solutions website. So if one of your colleagues missed the show, or you turned, tuned in late, or you simply want to review some of the material, you'll be finding out how to get to it early next week. Thank you, Denise. That concludes our webinar. I want to thank everyone for attending, and have a great day.